Hi, it's Steve. I am here today with Ed Lipinski. Hello, Ed. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, Steve. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. So, Ed, we're talking to you as a freedom fighter. Tell me, um, let's start this way. What does freedom mean to you? So, freedom, I, I guess in the simplest sense in my mind, is a vigilant dedication to oppose tyranny. Um, and it's not just, you know, an individual or personal freedom. It extends beyond myself as an individual. Um, you know, that, and that means fighting tyranny in whatever shape or form and also helping others, you know, our, our, our brothers and sisters and, and helping one another um, to overcome any type of, of tyranny um, that opposes or it gets in the way of freedom. Um, ultimately, um, I look towards Ronald Reagan um, and want to borrow two lines of thought from him um, when he had mentioned that, you know, if not me, then who? And if not, you know, now, then when? Um, in regards to, you know, fighting for freedom. And then secondly, more importantly, we need to realize that freedom isn't passed in, you know, through the blood. It's not a generic, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, genetic um, inherent trait that gets passed on from one generation to another. And ultimately, um, it's only always one um, generation away from being extinct. So we need to make sure we instill, you know, the, the um, fundamentals and, and the principles behind uh, freedom and our, our God-given rights that come from God and not the generosity of the state. And ultimately, it's, it's through teaching one another and, and um, you know, safeguarding um, those liberties is ultimately how we bring about freedom. That's a very comprehensive answer for sure. Um, if I was, mm -hmm. if I had asked you this question 15 years ago, would you have given me the same answer? Absolutely not. Um, I think it would have been more cookie cutter, basic rudimentary. It would have been, I get to do what I want and, you know, Basically, it would be more, I feel like, a, a selfish, um, kind of in individualistic uh, type of, of freedom that I would be thinking of it in terms of. It wouldn't be as broad and as, um, you know, based and rooted on our history as it is now. Um, so, you know, and I, I have excellent teachers and as well as my, my mom, you know, she was a history major. I have, you know, all of them to thank for, you know, properly teaching me and educating me to be raised and understand the importance of, of valuing our freedom. You mentioned teachers. Are you talking about teachers from school? Or are you talking about teachers in life? Who are they? Yes. So one uh, specific um, comes to mind. His name was Mr. Rosenzweig. Uh, he was my uh, teacher when I was a senior in Notre Dame High School in Niles. Um, he had actually created his own course, you know, drafted up the syllabus, the materials, and had to go to the board meetings and justify and argue for it. And ultimately, you know, was successful in pushing through his own course. And what we did there is um, we had analyzed primary source documents. So anything from, you know, Mein Kampf, uh, from Hitler to Nietzsche to, you know, all of the Enlightenment thinkers, the Leviathan. Um, we read either the whole, you know, if it was a smaller document, we'd read the whole thing. But in the case of books, we would just read portions of the text, um, but we would then analyze it in the context of, you know, the historical sense in the time period from which it was written. And then we would basically just circle up uh, in the classroom and uh, he would kind of lob a question out in, into the, the group, and then we would kind of discuss, debate, analyze, think critically. And it was through doing activities like that where it really ground, you know, what I was learning and the purpose behind the, the material instead of just here's the, here's the material, here's what you need to know, here's a definition or two. It was so much more beyond that. So I definitely have him to thank for that. Um, as far as a non-educational teacher, it would be the um, it would be the parents and adults um, chaperones while I was in Boy Scouts, ultimately up to the point where I made Eagle Scout. I'd say you know all of those individuals you know had a significant impact of 
why I believe what I believe and, you know, help build the character into the person I am today. <clears throat> so you've had a lot of values passed on to you. Your, your, your mom, your teachers, the scouts, they mm. all gave you a framework to evaluate the world. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, absolutely. And my dad being one of them too, he was one of those adult chaperones and, you know, he uh, didn't over baby us, I guess, you know, some people would think, oh, well, if your dad's there, he's going to care more about you than other kids. And he actually showed no favoritism. And um, I'm glad that he was there though, because it definitely helped me pick up some values from him and, you know, kind of, again, just shape uh, my overall character and, and moral compass. What do you feel is the biggest challenge to your moral compass these days? I guess I'd have to say um, the everyday occurrence of just how easy it is for doing something that is just simpler to do. So, for instance, you know, making that hard decision of staying on the straight and narrow, it, it is a you know conscientious decision you have to make day after day. Um, you know, you can get wrapped up sometimes in life. And when you see your friends, you know, that are your same age who are, you know, having more fun or what appears to be more fun and enjoying things so much more where it kind of might make you feel like at odds um, with your peers or even coworkers. Um, sometimes it seems that, you know, it's easier just to succumb and, and, to go along with the crowd and, and simply kind of go with the flow. But um, for me, there, there's times where, you know, it's, this is a hard line. Um, I remember my friend saying to me at one point, actually, and this was before I was even political whatsoever in the slightest bit. Um, we were just hanging out, having a conversation and a few drinks on the weekends. And, you know, they started getting into these topics and I kind of was just stating my opinion and, um, they then all of a sudden said, oh, well, Ed, when did you become so political? And I'm like, I'm not. This, this is just where my line is. This is where I can't agree with this subject anymore. Or this is where I say no. And, you know, um, that's not how I want to live. And that's not how I would want to raise my kids. So um, sometimes it just is easier to go with the crowd, especially when doing otherwise is unpopular or will ostracize you. Um, but as I've made decisions in my life, uh, during college, you know, I, I never was one that was concerned with having to impress the crowd or, you know, care what others thought. Um, I mean, one, one of the main times being when I was in the fraternity, I was actually president of the fraternity of Sigma Nu at Bradley University. And, um, you know, I had made a decision that was unpopular, but it's because I was standing with our values and being a knight of honor and, um, you know, I, I wanted to put my foot down on some childish behavior that simply couldn't continue. And after three times of opening my mouth in chapter and the seniors still disregarding it, you know, I, I made a uh, personal decision to uh, wake up early on a Saturday during a cleaning session, which I don't think a president had ever gone to one before in our house. And I woke up the, the house managers, told them, hey, don't worry, I got today's meeting, sat down the pledges. Um, gave them, you know, donuts and, and some uh, coffee. And I said, I'm here to learn from what you guys are learning. You know, I want you to show me. And basically, I allowed them to mimic the same exact destructive behavior, which was, you know, making a mess of the house and, you know, trying to prove, make them prove themselves more and just childish stuff that we had no room for in our, our fraternity. And um, yeah, I did upset some people. And, um, you know, it ended up changing the mentality of the house in a positive direction. But at the same time, me personally, I, you know, did strain some of my relationships. And, you know, if that's the cost of, of what it takes, then so be it. You know, I'm not one to um, want to shift and, you know, forget, you know, who I am and where I come from and, and those values that I do hold so dear. Um, to me, you know, I'm willing to be ostracized because, you know, you don't need to be the most important person in the room. Um, I, I learned in high school to get rid of my ego really quick when I uh, did a lot of volunteer work for children with developmental disabilities. And, um, you know, once you're helping someone else who can't really help themselves in everyday activities that we just take for granted, um, it really helps 
put me beside myself and realize how thankful I am for, for what I do have in front of me and what I am able to, to do myself. <clears throat> so you are a leader. That's what you're talking about. You, you led the fraternity in, in the proper direction. You changed their mentality and you developed a few enemies or at least people that weren't fans, which is the price of leadership. Does that bother you? Uh, you're a leader now. Does it, does it bother you when people criticize you, ostracize you, put you down? Um, only in the sense of when it's a connection or um, maybe a friendship or something that I thought was more. Um, sometimes I might be a little surprised, but overall in the grand scheme of things, if you're not causing some type of uproar, so to speak, or if you're not you know, creating some type of um, pushback or animosity or, you know, somebody saying, no, don't do it that way. Well, you know, you're not really doing it the right way, I guess, because you're, you're naturally, when you do follow, you know, a, a good standard and moral compass, there's always going to be people who don't want to, because again, those are the times you have to make harder decisions to conscientiously move in that direction. Whereas it's so much easier to just say disregard rules or disregard, you know, what the bylaws might say or what, you know, the rules of an organization might say. Um, so ultimately, you know, that, that's kind of how you know you're, I guess, doing a good job is by making a couple of, of people resent you. Now, granted, ideally, you know, I'm very open minded. I'm very easy to talk to. I'd like to think that, you know, there's nothing that people can't talk about and resolve kind of like our, our founding fathers, you know, they sat down in a room, hashed out the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between until they had what is such a beautiful document and what, you know, ultimately guides our freedom and, and our, our constitutional republic. And, you know, to be able to do that, it, it takes big men, um, for sure. And, um, you know, unfortunately, in today's society, people are so quick to just give their opinion and input and, you know, just have all this word vomit that, uh, unfortunately, conversations don't always have so much significance and value because we're not discussing things openly. We're not debating it and speaking, you know, on what are the talking points and what are the values or points of each side. Um, you know, we, we don't all need to always agree. We can always agree to disagree. But if we don't come to try and find that common ground together by open discussion and open dialogue, we're never really going to help grow and extend any real valuable thought on how we want to guide our country. I think that's true. Um, but you're involved in freedom work now. So tell us a little bit about the freedom work. And, and are you actually achieving some common ground with people that oppose you? Uh, so yes, actually. So um, some of the uh, initial work, I guess, to give some background, um, I had first joined a group called uh, Citizens for Free Speech. Um, it's an organization uh, led by uh, Patrick Wood. He's the founder and chairman of Citizens for Free Speech. There was a woman, Mary Baker, who, um, whose book was used as the guide for the uh, learning and, and the um, course segments. Uh, so I ended up working through that. Um, ended up becoming what's called a citizen uh, ninja ambassador. And so I was leading a week, a weekly, um, hour long uh, conversation and kind of re review of that material and kind of an extension of it by more applying it to every day, what's going on in everyday life and through um, the, the people that would attend the meeting, kind of what, what we were seeing, you know, whether it was in the media or in our organizations or institutions or uh, at work. And um, after doing that and kind of gaining some foothold into my civic understanding and kind of being able to understand the roadblocks um, to freedom and what would cause someone to be or not be um, involved, like, you know, fear of, you know, retribution or, you know, being made fun of or um, what's that called, um, you know, ultimately just being ostracized. You know, a lot of people have an inherent nature of not wanting to speak up or do an in-person, um, you know, speech in front of a room because, again, it's just uncomfortable and people aren't used to sharing and talking in front of others. And 
Um, so once I was able to do that and was kind of, you know, put some of my fears to the side and realize, hey, I, I can do this, you know, it doesn't take a, a really well put together speaker or some uh, politician to actually be in politics or be in the civic arena. And so uh, with that um, knowledge and, and understanding, I then um, had uh, Dan Schultz, I believe, put out um, a program called the Precinct Committeeman Project. And I had learned from that and after a call to action from General Michael Flynn, uh, when he was on a show called Making Sense of the Madness with John Michael Chambers, um, I remember hearing it and just being really drawn to the concept of let's, you know, make people accountable. Let's take over our, our party. Let's, you know, make it a true, you know, Republican organization. And so that's what led me to say, hey, I could be a precinct captain or precinct committeeman. Um, what I didn't realize is that Cook County is different than any other county in Illinois. So here I thought when I was, you know, meeting the local Republican group, I thought, okay, I need 10 signatures. I'll talk to my neighbors. I can be involved and just, it'll be a few blocks wide. Um, I, you know, quickly came to learn that the, uh, current commi committeeman at that point was getting ready to retire. And so instead of one precinct and needing 10 signatures, I was going to be uh, in charge of 45 precincts and I needed something around 230 plus signatures. And as soon as I found that out, I kind of sat back and thought on it and I said, you know what, challenge accepted. And so I didn't know exactly what I was gonna accomplish or how to go forward exactly, because it was kind of a surprise. Um, but I did know that with my moral compass and with knowing what I learned and had heard from General Flynn and Dan Schultz, I realized, you know, this this isn't a significantly difficult task. I mean, it is a difficult task because it's Illinois. Um, however, in terms of, you know, making our local organization and the Illinois Republican Party um, actually be a, a you know, what, what is that, a contender, if you will, to where we can actually get candidates elected, um, I realized, hey, this is where it's going to happen. It needs to happen on the local level. And, um, you know, I've now had my first year um, behind me as committeeman for Elk Grove Township. Um, we've had a couple of difficulties, and I've, I've found out a couple of players of, you know, who's my friend and who I can trust, and others that, you know, say everything that you want to hear and will tell you anything, but at the end of the day, they're not there for you or will leave you high and dry or talk you talk behind your back. So um, it, I, I've quickly been learning who's part of the uniparty, if you will, and those who are, you know, true Republicans and not just a name only. Um, so I, I, I've had some successes. Um, there's definitely challenges, but one of the biggest challenges I'd say there is, is motivating others to get involved. You know, they just see all of these reasons of why they shouldn't get involved and ultimately, that's the devil's condemnation. You know, when we get these thoughts in our heads of there's no point in me voting because my vote doesn't count or, you know, I'm not a politician and I can't speak well, so I shouldn't get involved. Um, you know, that, that's, you know, totally beside the point. And that is the devil's condemnation of just trying to trick you into allowing yourself to give up. But if we, you know, help reinforce one another um iron sharpens iron you know and if we just help you know challenge one another but look out for one another and put the petty childish issues to the side leave our egos at the door um we really can turn around the great state of illinois and, and make it worthy of being called the land of lincoln and you certainly have a great view on life great attitude great ethical code what are your sources of strength um, so my sources of strength would have to be my, ultimately my foundation and my roots, um, which were um, instilled within me by my parents, my mom and dad. Um, a lot of that has to do with my faith. Um, I guess I, you'd say I'm a, what's called a cafeteria Catholic because uh, after having some history teachers that have taught me a lot and where I, you know, thought critically, I realized that, well, any religious organization here on earth it's an institution of men, which by, you know, their inherent nature are flawed. Um, so I 
I believe that I don't need to find justification in another human being to value or to confirm what I believe internally. And, you know, it's my faith and belief in God, um, you know, wanting to, um, you know, when I ask him to, to wear his armor and that his spirit guides me um, to be my strength and that, you know, to work through me and allow me to carry out his will, ultimately, I am a child of God and I realize that everything I am today or have um, in life is because of God. And I'm thankful for the experiences I've had so far and, you know, my upbringing and because of my parents and instilling that ability to think critically, to think for myself, to rely on family, you know, my brothers and sisters, um, you know, they really are, are my rock and, and my strength and what helped me to carry forward. <clears throat> So, it's not a question of, is God helping you? It sounds like more like you're helping God. Is that accurate? I'd, I'd like to believe so. Um, you know, when I do pray, I, I ask that he does allow his spirit to work through me. And ultimately, I give myself up to him and, and want to carry out his will. Because um, after looking around and, and seeing the way society's been going, and I've, I've never always fit in as a kid um you know I had friends and I, I you know have my groups I'd hang out with but I always felt different somehow than others um kind of like I almost didn't belong or maybe I was ahead of my time or somehow you know maybe I was matured already even when I was a kid though and because I'd be thinking of these things that no other kids think of um but it's just I, I felt like there was a purpose of something more in life you know whereas a lot of people chase money and they think, you know, to have success, you need to have money and, and all these fake, you know, uh, designer brand name clothes or cars. Um, you know, I, I realized very quickly that you don't take any of it with you. Um, you know, maybe the Egyptians were buried with some of their possessions, but again, you're not taking it anything from this material 3D world and it's not going with us after we pass. So when you realize everything is, I guess, not to say in a bad way or negative way, but nothing here matters really. Um, you know, yes, we want to have comfort. Yes, we want to have, you know, food. We want to have possessions and live life comfortably. But um, I realized that, you know, money is a fake indebtment, a fake debt enslavement system. And I've realized that actually since I was a kid in high school, um, that, that's why I've never chased it with such veracity. I know it comes and goes and um again yeah you need you know money to have some personal security but at the end of the day it's not what provides any value or, or happiness and when i weigh in my mind you know the value of my soul or you know my personal integrity um i think that no money can't buy that because it's fake and what i have is real um and so um, yeah, it, it's it's definitely been an interesting ride to say the least. But um, you know, given that things here aren't going to go with us when we pass, it's, I know that the important things are our time and who we spend it with and what we spend it doing. And that's kind of why I, I do want to be a fighter for God and for good, and and definitely combat the truly sick and vile things going on in society. Bravo. That brings us to our last question. Since you brought a purpose and life work, let's fast forward 100 years to your great great grandchildren and the generation at that time. What should they know about you and the work you're doing now? How do you want to be remembered? You know, I, that's an interesting question because I felt like when I was younger, that's what I was chasing almost as if, you know, there's going to be a book written about me or, you know, as if, um, you know, my name will be known and carried on. And, you know, I, when I realized that, you know, I'm just a speck of dust in this huge cosmic, um, you know, soup, if you will. Um, yes, each, each life is important. And yes, I do feel like I would love to leave an impact, but, um, it's not really 
my story that matters. It's, it's really doing what needs to be done and, you know, whether or not there's praises sung about you. Um, I, I kind of dismiss needing to have that validity um, because uh, as, as someone would find out by going to my LinkedIn profile, my pronouns are no one and nobody. Um, you know, I, again, I leave my ego completely at the door. I think I've lost the majority of my ego ever since I was volunteering in high school for children with developmental disabilities. And, um, you know, I, I realized that, hey, I, I am no one, I'm nobody, and especially without God. Um, so therefore, I'm okay to kind of just be left at the wayside. But um, I guess if the stories through family and, and sharing and passing down, I guess I'd want them to know that, you know, um, I'm someone who truly loves their country, uh, that values all of our brothers and sisters who have gone before us, that have paid the ultimate sacrifice in fighting to defend um, our civil liberties, our, our rights, and our great United States Constitution. And, you know, had we lost and the Constitution been thrown to the side, I mean, you hear it time and time again that the United States is the last beacon of hope. It's the the light up on the, the hill, and it's the last true source of freedom in this, this world. Um, so knowing the gravity of all of that put together, you know, that that's really what, what makes me want to fight. It's not about me personally and what I will get or what reward. It's reward to me is knowing that it's been safeguarded, that, you know, my, my children, their children's children, and, you know, everyone is able to have that, that ability to have a slice of, of the American dream and to be able to chase that. And, you know, that's, that's really what does it for me. <clears throat> Can't ask for anything more altruistic and righteous. And, um, I know that when people in a hundred years see this interview, they will get the message. <laughs> so right. you, you, I know your intention is to, is to just do your job, have God take you with open arms when your mm -hmm. final day in this planet comes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that this website is around in a hundred years so they can at least mm -hmm. learn from you. Um, I want to thank you for speaking from your heart. I want to thank you for sharing your strength. And your, 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 all your, your messages specifically about leadership. And um, I'm, I'm happy because I know that when people see this interview um, and, and see what an authentic person you are, it will motivate them to take a stand because I think people understand that we need people that feel, people that feel the importance of today and and recognize that they can contribute to a good cause um all they need is a little bit of a pat in the back and a little bit of encouragement and they'll start on the journey so you are going to set people on that journey thank you so much ed thank you steve i appreciate all your time and for what you do you know putting the website together and and all of your efforts so kudos to you as well thank you thank you